Well, welcome everybody. How are you? Coach here. Hey, I hope things are uh, things are going well. They're going well for Maestro and I. They really are. We have a bit of a change of plans here lately, which I would really like to share with you guys. But just that I don't jinx it, I'm going to wait till it actually happens, then do the reveal. Hey, this week we are talking about trees, and not for a good reason. We are talking about 10 trees through my personal and professional experience I would never have in a residential yard. This week I'd like to share those 10 with you. And it's not the only 10 out there. It's just ones that I've been exposed to and ones that, you know, I've, I know the problems. So thanks for taking a couple of minutes and joining me here. Let's dive in, shall we? Hey friends, Maestro here, just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. Okay, welcome back. Hey, first off, a little disclaimer here. I'm sure there are several more, several more tree varieties out there that are very problematic. In fact, I would love to hear your opinion on these trees that I've mentioned and ones that you've had experience with and would avoid in the future and why. The selections I have listed here are because of my not only professional experience but also personal experience as well. The reason for these selections is related to a few problematic habits that the trees possess and the increased maintenance, damaging roots, messy, messy lifestyle, and way oversized when mature. Those are just a few of the problems. Okay, let's get into it, shall we? At the top of the list. And remember, I have a big retail nursery background, a lot of ornamental hort in my, my little pea brain. And this was a tree that when I first got involved in the late 70s, was just all the rage. It really was. But oh my God, little did we know, this thing has really no business. Some of the newer varieties are a little better. But here we go. The Bradford pear tree, Pyrus caloriana. Why, you ask? I think mainly, mainly because of the weak wood and the branching habit that it has. It is so freaking brittle. It really is. You can have a strong wind. 20, 25 miles an hour somewhere. And this thing will break branches like nobody's business. And if you get a big snow load or a really, really strong storm, this thing can just get uprooted and knocked over or it can break in half. It was one that uh, I really, really don't even, it, it doesn't even come out of my mouth anymore when I start talking about trees to use. I mean, it's nowhere near. Again, shallow rootedness, and they succumb to things like uh, fire blight really easy. If the tree is super healthy, it can recover a little bit, but it always has this blackened limb, blackened stems look to it. And then it can be the harbinger of the virus and possibly infect some of your other trees in the area that you want to keep around. It is a very hard disease to cure, except through really radical, aggressive pruning literal amputation far below the infected area and that can become kind of problematic it really is i mean we don't our busy lives we shouldn't have to worry about trees like this we shouldn't and make sure that if you're out there buying property or buying a house for yourself and you see one of these things or your city is planting these as your complimentary street tree yeah you know just be aware of it period pruning and getting up inside to prune, arborists hate them. They, did. they don't like the client. They just start butchering them. They really do. So avoid the Bradford pear if you can. It is beautiful in the springtime. It has a gorgeous, gorgeous blossom, just profuse blossom season. But it is very, very, very prone to diseases, breakage. And if you get some of those big ones, like 30 by 30s, and something happens in the wintertime, and it comes a-crashing, hopefully it doesn't hit anything valuable. Okay, another one. Number two, silver maple. Oh, I know you guys in the Northeast are either going to hate or love me on this one. 
because it does have, you know, it's not the sugar maple, but it does have a sap and it can be harvested. But, oh my God, these things are so fast growing and they look really neat for about the first 10 years. But the big problem, it's what's going on underneath the ground. These things have a root system that are absolutely impenetrable. Pulling a mature one out, even if you had machinery, you would be hard pressed to pull some of these things out. They have a very huge, intricate, complicated root system, and it will go anywhere and everywhere to find water. It will go through and underneath your foundation. If you have a slab foundation and there's a water source underneath that slab, it will continue to pump a root system under there and grow that root system, causing damage. Driveways, no problem. They'll go through a driveway like nobody's business. They will heave streets. They will cause a lot of root heave in their place of planting, oftentimes resulting in the inability to plant anything underneath them, including lawn. Some lawn will do okay, but you got to give these things a lot of room. If you have acreage, get them out there in the acreage, far away. Put them near a water source or something where they're very happy and enjoy them from a distance. Unlike some of their other cousins, this particular maple doesn't have great fall color. It has kind of mediocre fall color, so you really can't claim to fame that at all. So, yep, the silver maple, do a rethink if you see that and you're considering it. Okay, moving on. One that I grew up with a little bit, so did Maestro, and one that is a pain in the butt for a residential yard, and that is Weeping Willow. It is okay in larger areas, preferably like <laughs> down by the pond on a five acre ranch. Okay, that'll work. But if you put this thing in a backyard because you got to play with it underneath grandma's yard way back when, when she had two acres and the backyard was nothing but a lawn and a willow tree, so you had fond memories or whatever, don't put it in a small backyard. Very, very fast growing, very intense. It competes with the silver maple as far as the type of root system that it has, and it is a water hog, big time water hog. It will do anything to go find it. Don't you dare put it anywhere near any sort of leech lines or septic tank, especially lawns. I mean, it'll just gobble a lawn up. There, there won't be any room for lawn, and then trying to mow a lawn with a willow tree in there, it becomes very, very very problematic. In addition, it has a constant twig drop. And in some cases, multiple times a year during the growing season, especially if it gets a little dry, it'll start dropping leaves all over the place. And then there's the high pollen count when it goes to flower in the late spring. If you have allergies, like I do, very, very irritating type of pollen. It will attract a lot of bees and pollinators, but much to your chagrin. Then there's the fall leaf drop. And it is not a over and done with in a couple of weeks. No, this thing will drag itself out for a couple of months. And then during a windstorm or something, you can get some of the weaker wood that break off and drop to the ground, causing, uh, causing problems like breaking understory plants, etc. So Weeping Willow, even though it's got its fame rooted in religion and mythology and all, even movies, you know, Grandmother Willow in the Disney film. And I can't remember the name of the film. Ah, <sighs> Grandmother Willow. I think it was uh, Pocahontas. Hey, number four, the Coast Redwood, Sequoia Sempervirens. I, transparency here as usual, I have to openly admit I have planted this tree in residential yards. Early on in my landscape design and contracting career, my bad. It was requested. It was very popular back then, but it is not a good choice for a professional to appease a customer based on their wants and knowing full well what it's going to do. It is a massive, one of the largest trees on the face of the planet, and it can overwhelm smaller yards, infrastructure, and hardscape. I can remember uh, a competitor planting a row of these in a raised retaining wall bed. There was a six-foot fence. 
then a five foot retaining wall bed, and then the retaining wall was about four feet tall. And he planted those things in there. And he went out and got some 24 inch box specimens. So, you know, they were already well underway. And in 10 years, 10 years, my arborist tree service company that I used was out there cutting them down because the retaining wall was cracked and being pushed over. Very, very invasive root system. Uh, they too are water hogs. They want it and they want it bad. And your sprinkler irrigation ain't going to get it done. In some cases, it's going to go deep, but more than likely, it's going to rip through your lawn and into your neighbor's lawn and whatever it takes for them to survive. Now, the variety I used was a little subdued. It's not the original Coast Redwood. It was the variety called Aptos Blue. Sometimes Santa Cruz, but most of the time Aptos Blue. So it didn't get quite as large, uh, but it was a lot more dense. And that's the other thing, is cone drop, leaf drop, uh, leaf litter on a constant regular basis as the tree matures. And it has a propensity to stain if leaves fall on concrete and then uh, uh, sit there and get wet, you will have the imprint, almost permanent imprint, unless you get some uh, pressure washing done yeah, forever. And then there's the cone drop. Cone drop can be uh, kind of invasive. And then you have the root heave. And at the base of some of the original varieties, you will have the sucker growth or the collar around there that will constantly be wanting to produce suckers that you have to stay on top of. So, although beautiful in the right spot, this is meant for a large yard where there's plenty of water and plenty of rain to keep it happy, not for a residential yard. Okay, moving on. A deciduous one, sycamore, uh, either American or European, either one, Platinus acerifolia or Occidentalis. I know I will sound like a broken record here, but this is another tree, very large tree that really looks stupendous. It really does. It's a beautiful baby tree. The first 10 years of that thing, you're going to say, wow, that, look at the bark coming onto that. Look at the beautiful leaves. And then something happens. And a lot of it where I was in the Central Valley of Northern California, I think the biggest drawback to it was the anthracnose problem that it had during the, the growing season. Anthracnose would come in and infect a lot of the sycamore trees. And as a result, they would defoliate. They'd defoliate right in the summertime, the heat, of the heat of the summer. You'd think it was fall, and there was no fall color as a result of that. It was brown leaves, crispy critter, and you had to keep up on it and dispose of it properly. Uh, otherwise, it, <laughs> the spores and everything from the disease would just reinfest. Now, if you had a really healthy sycamore tree, they would bounce back. It would take a few weeks, but they would put out new growth. And as long as there was no more anthracnose in the air being blown around, but I have seen sycamore trees be infested two and three times, and um, it can take its toll. You know, imagine you, if you had a, a chest cold time after time after time after time, you are not going to be a healthy individual. And the same thing goes for trees. Then you have the, the little furry seed pods that drop, and those things are just a royal pain in the to have to clean up. Uh, and it can cause uh, you know, kind of a skin irritation if you're doing it barehanded. They have this little silky, fine, cottony, spiky balls that uh, can really kind of irritate. So make sure you wear gloves or long sleeves if you have to clean them up. And then there's a, a constant twig drop from some of the mature trees. You'll get a, you'll get a twig drop that you just like a shedding all the time. So maybe sycamore is not a tree for you. Now, on the plus side, it does have a beautiful bark to it. It really does. It has a mottled, dark gray, light gray, blotchy type of bark. Man, it's gorgeous. But enjoy it somewhere else, not in your front or backyard. All right, number six, moving on. Oleander. A lot of standards, especially out west. California, Arizona, Nevada. A lot of times you have the, the oleander trained into a tree. They get to be about 20, 25 feet tall, about 15 to 20 feet wide, and very, very pretty from a distance during blooming season. But they come with uh, several drawbacks. They're very, very prone to diseases like crown gall, sooty mold fungus, um, scale, 
bacterial blights, and then there's the messy flower cleanup, which the flowers can actually stain. I found scale pests to be rather prevalent on them, which brought in ants, which brought in honeydew, which brought in the sooty mold fungus. It was just a vortex from hell when it came. But honestly, you know, in, in a case such as this, I came across several clients that had them, and then I had to re remove them. Oh, <laughs> that's no fun. A mature oleander tree or bush can be quite quite the task. Plus they do have a mild toxicity, the sap and the leaves and stuff. I've never seen animals eat them, horse, dog. I've never seen them eat them, but it does have a mild toxicity to it. Okay, number seven, as they said in horticultural school, eucalyptus, but actually it's called eucalyptus. Eucalyptus varieties, there's some original ones that are out there from uh, Australia. Uh, but the cultivars that I dealt with was the, the silver dollar tree, the red flowering gum tree. But the biggies, the big ones, were the ones I grew up with in the East Bay, the San Francisco Bay Area. My dad found a source somewhere, which he always found a source, something for free. He grew them for the very fast growth, and he wanted to screen off property and create kind of a windbreak and that kind of stuff. My dad was good in the career that he had, but he was not very good when it came to landscaping. He didn't have any vision, and the cheaper he could find it, the better. Yeah, we had eucalyptus trees that were 60 and 70 feet tall, and the bark shed that those big things had, and the acorn drop, and the leaf drop, you'd be out there all weekend long raking stuff up if you hadn't done it in a recent amount of time. Some of the smaller varieties, like the silver dollar tree, the red flowering gum tree, they can be pruned and kept into somewhat of a manageable shape, but uh, not this big one. No, you wanna stay away from that really do. They are considered water hogs, and they do have quite a root heave upon maturity. Now, why else did Pops have it? We cut uh, huge pieces out all the time. There was times where we literally took the tree down to uh, a 24-inch stump, and it would just pop right back. And then we used the, the wood for firewood back then. So, very prevalent on the West Coast, California, Arizona, sometimes Nevada, but not very much down there. Yep, stay away from eucalyptus. Number eight, we're talking about the honey locust, Gladitsia triancanthos. I find their fall color being about the biggest plus, and that is it, the color. Those little microscopic leaflets, when they start dropping and you try to clean, Good the freak luck to, to clean them all up. If they fall into a, a mulched area, into a planting bed, you're never going to get them out. You'll take all your mulch out trying to get those leaves out. On the patio, if it gets wet, try to pick those things up. Even with a broom. The best way I found to clean up after them was blow them onto the lawn and mow them. Generally, the vacuum cycle of the mower would, would pick a lot of it up. But uh, some do have thorns. They have a lot of twig and messy drop. And then the coup de gras is their curling seed pods, big seed pods that they drop. That can be uh, quite messy, quite protracted of a season, and uh, just not, you know, honey locusts can even get big. It's, it's probably too big for the residential 60-foot wide, 100-foot deep residential yard. You can find many other choices. Okay, moving on. One that I have personal experience with that I had in the first house I had when I moved to the Central Valley, and that is the Chinese tallow tree, Triadica sebifera. I had one of these in my front yard when I relocated out there. One of the most gorgeous fall-colored trees I've ever owned, if you like uh, burgundy red. They did a heck of a job as far as coloring up the front yard, but they did a bigger job on dropping seed pods, little seed balls, that really germinated fast, and I had Chinese tallow all over places that I had no business having Chinese tallow tree. I really didn't. Very invasive. So that tree, enjoyed one fall, was yanked out of the ground the following year. It just, no thank you. Uh, between the twig drop, the annoying seeds, and kind of the, the spread of the root system, even though I didn't have a uh, a walkway heave or anything else, I found it hard to plant stuff in and around. So I kind of I kind of stayed away from it. And this one too kind of has a mild toxicity to it. 
especially the sap that can cause a skin irritation. I've never seen anybody or anything eat it, but I, I guess goats might. But goats eat poison oak, for Christ's sake, and they don't seem to be a problem with it. All right, moving on. Number 10, one of the last ones, and that is the mulberry tree, whether it be the fruiting or non-fruiting. Morris alba or Morris rubrum. A very, very popular tree for shade 30 or 40 years ago, mainly the fruitless mulberry. Very fast growing shade trees. People couldn't get enough of them. But the fruiting variety has been a reliable fruit source for hundreds, if not thousands, of years, either here in this country or over in the Middle East and Europe. But the fruiting variety can be a rather messy, rather messy tree, mainly from that tasty fruit. It has a very long, protracted ripening period, and you will have some that are ripe some that are not, and some who are just barely getting started. And so you have this four-week, five-week, where you have to be out there all the time. And guaranteed, stained hands, guaranteed, stained cars, driveways, walkways, clothes. The fruits are so tender. They're almost like a really delicate blackberry. And they are so tender and tasty, but at a cost. It really is. You really have to be on it at the right time, all the time during harvest, to keep the area in and around it clear. Now, the fruitless trees, famous for the shade, but can result in root problems very, very quickly. Uh, lifting up, I can remember planter beds being destroyed at a rental that I had. I can remember having such dense shade underneath it. No lawn would grow. And the main way of pruning all the time was just to go in and butcher the tree every year. They call it bollard pruning, and they would just butcher it back to stumps. Those things would just pop back the next year, and they would be very good size by the end of the growing season. But the wood that was produced after that radical pruning would be secondary wood and not as strong, and it never really became strong like the original wood. It is not good for firewood. And so it's just kind of a pain in the butt. Now, if you had big acreage and you wanted, oh, say you had a, uh, a moist hillside and you had it 500 feet wide and 150 feet uphill and you put a series of five of them out there, okay, let, let them do their thing. Prune them maybe once every five years or so that would be a much more proper application of this tree. Not a small residential tree whatsoever. Not a fan. Not a fan of mulberry trees. Okay, and one bonus one that I'm going to give you is the liquid amber tree. Liquid amber styraciflua. <laughs> Many of you know them by the sticky ball tree. And when I say sticky, I don't mean like a sap. I mean like a thorn, a thorn seed pod that drop. Those things, mm, a lot of people don't like them. Very, very native back to the, the, the east and the southeast. They just grow wild back there. But for the residential tree in the retail nursery industry, way back in the late 70s, early 80s, we had various cultivars of it. And some of them have been, I think Cherokee is one. Cherokee is one where they have hybridized it to the point where it has little to no sticky seed pods that actually drop sticky balls, but the leaves are a little different. Back in the day, you had uh, varieties like Festival and Burgundy uh, and the original one, and their claim to fame was their fall color. I mean, they were very, very pretty in the fall, but they get big. They do have a lot of leaf drop, and they do have a little bit of a, uh, oh, a sap problem when it gets on cars or gets on uh, concrete and that kind of stuff. So I would suggest that the original liquid amber be eh, Shanghai, and then just look into the more newer cultivars like Cherokee and some of the other ones. Well, hey, there you go. You got uh, 10 choices plus a bonus on trees that I personally would stay away from. You guys do your own due diligence though. You know, you look into it and you research it and make a good knowledgeable decision before you make selections. Can some of these be a great landscape tree in the right application? Absolutely. Yes, they can. 
Uh, but going to the retail nursery on a Saturday morning and getting one of these guys and plunking it in your teeny tiny yard because you have a fond memory is not the reason why you put a tree in the ground. Make sure it's in the right place for the right reason. That's what I have for you this week. As always, to your guys' landscape success, check back with me next Friday. Don't forget the website, youryardcoach.com, if you'd like to get some education. And I appreciate your time, as always. Until next Friday, bye for now. Hey, friends, Maestro here. Just dropping a reminder to check out the podcast description for discount opportunities and any important links. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on a specific app, please don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps us grow and continue to provide these free podcasts. Again, thanks for listening to this week's show, and we'll see you right here next week.